special tonight. I want you to take your Bibles, if you will, please, and turn to the book of Mark, the Gospel of Mark tonight. And I want to take just a few moments. I'm not going to be long, I don't think, this evening. I think we can, I think we can knock this out in about 30 minutes. And so, uh, but, but I want to give you, <clears throat> this is simple, but I want to give you <clears throat> some really, really important life lessons tonight. And God's, God's doing great things, and we've got a lot of leaders in our church, and And so I want to try to talk to leadership tonight. Some of you aren't leading yet. You don't know this, but God has plans for you. (laughs) And you will be. And so if you don't feel like you're in any kind of a leadership uh, position, well, just hang in there. Because more than likely, God's going to give you some, some area to lead in. And then some folks don't feel like they're leading when they really are leading. If you're a parent here tonight... You're in leadership. You're in leadership. Uh, and if you're a grandparent, you're in leadership. And a lot of different ways that leadership is defined. But I want to talk to you about that subject tonight. Leadership is earned. Leadership is earned. Mark chapter 10 in your Bibles when you find your place. Let's all stand tonight out of respect for the reading of God's Word. And we're going to begin in verse number 35 and read down through verse number 45 tonight. Mark chapter 10 and verse 35 And we're going to read a very interesting story here. The Bible says in verse 35, And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. And he, talking about the Lord, and he said unto them, What would ye that I should do for you? They said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit, one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand, in thy glory. But Jesus said unto them, Ye know not what ye ask. Can ye drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? And they said unto him, We can't. And Jesus said unto them, Ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of and with the baptism that I'm baptized with all shall ye be baptized But to sit on my right hand on on my left hand is not mine to give. But it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. By the way, church, you know, this is just a good place to insert this. You don't have to, you know, a lot of churches, you don't have to politic for leadership. If God wants to put you in a leadership capacity, he'll do that. I tell preacher boys sometimes, God knows your address and your number. You don't have to worry about that. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, if you want to, uh, people sometimes, in a preacher sometimes, want to be an itinerant preacher. And if God wants you to be an itinerant preacher, he knows where you are. And he, he can set up the meetings, and you don't have to go around like a politician, kissing babies and blowing kisses and, and hoping, you know, that people are going to get to know you. And that's what the Lord is saying here. Verse 41, and when the 10, in other words, the 10 other disciples, and when the 10 heard it, And they began to be much displeased with James and John. But Jesus called them to him and saith unto them, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. Look at verse 43, though. He said, But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. By the way, that just pretty much means servant. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And so you may be seated tonight. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that subject. This is going to be more of a lesson probably than a message or a sermon But I want to talk to you about leadership is earned. Leadership is earned. And so uh, give me about 30 minutes and and, and give me your undivided attention, if you will. And we'll say, I think we'll say a few things that will be beneficial to you tonight. And so let's go to the Lord and ask God to help us. And we'll jump right into the Bible study tonight. Lord, we love you and thank you for the privilege to be here tonight. And God, how we pray now that you'll come and breathe upon us. I pray the Spirit of God, that holy dove of heaven, would rest in this place tonight and, and uh, Lord, have freedom, God, to move. Oh, God, forgive us of anything in our life that might be unconfessed or be a hindrance to the working of, 
of the Holy Spirit. Lord, forgive me. Cleanse us of our sins. And God, help us to walk holy before you. And Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll come now and teach us a great lesson, one that we can take home with us, one that we can use in our homes and our families and our ministries. And so, Lord, bless us, please. Help us, please. And we thank you and love you. In Jesus' name, we pray. And for his sake, amen. And so Mark chapter 10, James and John have come to the Lord with a very specific request. They want to be seated in a place of prominence, one on the right hand of the Lord and one on the left hand of the Lord when he comes into his kingdom and comes into his glory. Now, again, I'm not exactly sure what's going on with James and John, and I don't know, know what would, you know, would uh, motivate them to ask for something like this, but they do, at any rate, they do. And when the other disciples hear about this, boy, they are seriously upset with James and John. And so much so that the Lord Jesus takes this opportunity to teach them all. He sort of sits them all down, all 12 of them, and he begins to teach them a very important lesson. And here's the lesson. Before you can expect to lead, you'll first have to serve. Now, if you don't get anything else tonight out of the message, I want you to be sure you get that. I've got that highlighted and blown up because that's really my main point tonight. And I'm going to give you a few things and a few thoughts tonight. And we'll put a, a few things on the screen. But that's really the whole, uh, the whole gist of the message tonight. Before you can expect to lead, you'll first have to serve. Now, again, I won't say that again because it's so important. Before you can expect to lead, You'll first have to serve. Now, the world's mentality, and the reason I'm emphasizing that is because the world's mentality is this, that if you're the leader, you get served. That's how the world thinks. And so the world, uh, that, and that's sort of where the world lives. The world wants people to serve them. I want folks to serve me. I want folks that will wait on me hand to foot. I want folks that will bring me a drink. I want folks that will bring me a, uh, some type of refreshment and to feed me grapes and, and fan me with palm leaves. I mean, that's sort, of, that's sort of where, unfortunate, but that's where the world lives. I mean, they, they want to finally get to that place in life where uh, they don't have to lift a finger, don't have to go to work, don't have to do anything. They've got servants and butlers and bakers and cooks and all those kind of things. Uh, but here's the Lord's mentality, not the world's mentality, but the Lord's mentality is this. If you want to lead, then you must first be willing to serve. And by the way, we don't have a better teacher than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. The greatest leader, by the way, he was the greatest. You fill in the blank. He was the greatest of anything. He was the greatest preacher, greatest teacher. He's the greatest healer. I mean, you, you mark it down. Uh, he is the greatest of everything. He's the greatest carpenter. He, he is the greatest of all, but he is definitely the greatest leader and the greatest leader of all made himself into a servant. In fact, the Bible says in Philippians chapter two, verse seven, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And I was reading just this week over in John chapter 13, a uh, very interesting story. The Bible says that Jesus has sat down with his disciples and they've had supper together. And Jesus, at the end of the meal, Jesus sort of a, maybe abruptly gets up and he begins to take off his garments, the garments that he would wear out, you know, uh, uh, among people. And he begins to gird himself, the Bible says, with a towel. At this point, I'm thinking the disciples are probably wondering, what in the world, what, what, what is Christ doing? He girds himself with a towel, he gets a basin of water, and he goes around and he begins to wash the dirty feet of the disciples. Now, most folks back in that day wore sandals, and it is very, very dusty and dry over in Israel, and, uh, and these people, a lot of these people walked everywhere they went, and so their feet got extremely, extremely dirty. And so here the Lord of Lords is in John chapter 13, and he's coming by each of the disciples and he is washing their feet and then he's wiping their feet off with, these, uh, with this towel. Now, what's the Lord trying to teach? And that's this, that if you want to lead first, you have to serve. I want to ask you a question tonight. Do you have a desire to lead? 
You say, well, preacher, I do. I want to be a leader. I, I want to be recognized as a leader. Then let me ask you this next question. Who have you served in the last few days? You see, if you haven't served, you don't deserve to lead. Well, I'm so glad they taught me this, this principle in Bible college. Uh, I'm glad that, you know, uh, uh, my, the, the, the men that poured into me, they knew that, they knew that we were uh, ministerial students. They knew that we were preachers. They knew that we were, uh, we were future pastors and future uh, evangelists and future spiritual leaders. And yet my leader said this, if you can't sweep a bus or if you're not willing to grab a broom and, and sweep up dirt, you have no business preaching. And I'm, I am so glad that I had some people that told me that because that is so true. And that's what I'm teaching tonight. That if you had to have a desire to lead, then it means you must serve. Now let me break this down for you. Hey, fellas, do you have a desire to lead your family? Now let me give you some good advice. You better learn to serve. I'm talking about your family. I'm talking about your wife. You say, well, preacher, I'll tell you one thing. I'll never serve my wife, and I'll tell you one thing. You'll never be a leader. And if you ever become one, you won't be a good one. And by the way, can I just remind you of this? In Ephesians chapter 5, when the Bible talks about the woman submitting to the man, don't forget, before that verse, it says submitting yourself one to the other. But we don't talk about that verse very much. And so you're going to have to serve. You see, fellas, it's not all about you. It's not all about supper being ready when you get home at your beck and call. It's not all about your slippers and your easy chair waiting and your newspaper in your hand and your TV remote at the ready. Leadership means that you may have to occasionally help with the meal. I don't expect to get a lot of amens tonight, but never fear because I will amen myself because I know we're on course tonight. Leadership means, leadership means you may have to help with the homework. Leadership means you may have to help by playing catch and getting your glove and the ball and going outside. And, and uh, leadership means you may have to participate in the kickball game. Leadership means that you may have to go outside and, and fly a kite. Now, again... Now, now, you say, preacher, why are you preaching this? I'll tell you why I'm preaching it. Because it needs to be preached. Hey, fellas, don't expect to come home from work and play video games for three and a half hours straight and neglect your wife and neglect your children and don't lift a hand to help and expect to be a leader and for your family to follow. It ain't gonna happen. Because if you're gonna lead, it means you've gotta serve. You've gotta serve. Hey, ladies, do you want to lead your home? I have some good advice. You better serve your home. Titus chapter 2 verse 3 says it like this. The aged women likewise, that they be in behaviors, becometh holiness. Not false accusers, not giving much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Again, the idea is this, that if we're going to lead, if God is going to give us a leadership position, that leadership is earned. And if we want to be the leader of our home, it means serving. It's not coming in and throwing your weight around and seeing who can holler the loudest. Amen. Man, I'm telling you what, I'm about to amen myself tonight because what I see going on in so many homes and in so many families is exactly what I'm preaching against tonight. Listen, it's time where we get over ourselves and understand that you're maybe not as high and mighty as you think you are and, and maybe you don't deserve everything you think you deserve and it is time that we take on a servant spirit and when we get home, just serve. Hey, listen, do you want to lead in ministry? Then it means this, it means you must serve. Ministry and leadership is earned through serving. Now you say, Pastor, what are you talking about? Let me give you at least a few thoughts tonight and we'll, we'll let you go. How about this? Number one, serve through friendliness. Serve through friendliness. Proverbs chapter 18, verse number 24 says it like this. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. 
And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Serve through friendliness. I understand that Disney has some serious moral issues going on. They really do. In fact, I would, I would encourage you to be very, very careful about Disney. And I, I understand that, that they're, they're struggling right now. Morally, they're struggling. But for years and years and years, Disney has been a place where business has been booming and the stock's been going up and, and, and uh, they have a 70% return rate at Disney. Now, listen, don't, don't, don't you know, turn me off yet, all right? I want you to hear me out. Let me tell you why that is. Because Disney is known as one of the friendliest places on earth. In fact, they call it the happiest place on earth. That's what they say, the happiest place on earth. By the way, that's changing. But years ago, when we were kids and we would go there, man, I'm going to tell you what, they were the friendliest people and they would welcome you, you know, into their park and man, they just went out of their way to try to accommodate you and bless you and, and let you know that, that, that they were glad you're here. Now I said that to say this, that philosophy works for secular, but that philosophy also works for spiritual. Hey church, get out of your box and learn to speak to people. Hey, teachers, can I tell you something tonight? Again, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if this is what you call a good sermon. Good, I have, and I don't right now. I don't really care. You teachers that are going to be teaching life application classes, don't expect everybody just to just to stampede to your classroom because you think that you're Billy Sunday or D.L. Moody. I hate to bust your bubble. It ain't going to happen. You know what you're going to have to do? If you want people to come to your class, you're going to have to say, hey, brother, brother Mike, man, I'm so glad you came today. How's your week been, man? Everything going all right? Anything I can pray about for you tonight? Hey, by the way, we're having a class not long, and I, well, I'd love for you to come to our class. That'd be wonderful. And Angie, you come too. And, and uh, now, wait a minute now. You know what? You're going to have to do that. You're going, to have to, you're going to have to get out and you're going to have to act like you are genuinely concerned about people. And how many know this? That people don't care how much you know until first they know how much you care. And one of the reasons, one of the, I'm not saying it's the only reason, but one of the reasons that God is blessing the Calvary Baptist Church is because, thank God, we have a congregation that is letting people know we care about you, we're glad you're coming, everybody's welcome, doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter what you look like, doesn't matter where you're coming from, everybody's welcome at the Calvary Baptist Church. And so we serve through friendliness. Most of you know, most of you know the name Carlo Leto. Brother Leto has preached for several times here at Calvary, not in the new building, but down here in the old building. Brother Leto was my mentor. I first went to Bible college, and, and man, I was, I was so green and just a young whippersnapper. And, and uh, Brother Carlo, oh, I'm sorry, whippersnapper, that's Greek for, uh, anyway. And uh, <laughs> Brother Carlo, he just, uh, he just took me under his wing. And, and Brother Carlo began to pour into my life and my wife. And man, he began to train us and teach us. And I really think this, I think Brother Carlo is probably one of the greatest leaders that I've ever met. He pastors the Salisbury Baptist Temple up in Salisbury, Maryland. And man, they're just doing a bang up job and God's blessing and people are being saved and, and just an exciting, exciting place. But I said that to say this, one of the reasons that Brother Carlo earned that that place of leadership is because Brother Carlo was probably one of the friendliest people that I had ever met. I can remember going to, to Bible college and I started working in overnight transportation and Brother Carlo worked there before I got there and I remember him meeting me down there in the, in the break room and just, I mean, buddy, he put it on thick and, and man, he just loved me and by the way, it wasn't fake. To this day, he'll tell me. To this day, he'll call me and he'll say, Brother Steve, I love you. I love you. We hardly ever get to see each other, but man, we love each other from a distance. And, and he made a, a huge impact in my life. You know why? Because he served with friendliness. This week I was watching, I was just going, I was just going over YouTube and I was, I was just looking for some preaching. And a fellow by the name of Stephen Chapel came up. I thought, Stephen Chapel. It's Paul Chapel's brother. 
Stephen and I went to college together. And I, I watched the service, and man, Brother Stephen, so sharp. I mean, just sharp as a tack. He looked great. Man, he had a great delivery, and he preached a great message. And, uh, and he's pastoring a, a thriving church uh, down close to San Diego, California, and just doing a great job. And as I watched that video on YouTube, I thought, you know what? I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. Because when I went to college with Brother Steve, he was one of the nicest, one of the friendliest guys that I had ever met. And Brother Stephen on the weekend would come and he would, he would be a, a, a real servant to my wife and I. And I could tell you so many stories. And again, what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying serve through friendliness. I found this uh, story this week. The location was Berlin, Germany. Jesse Owens seemed sure to win the long jump at the 1936 Olympic Games. The year before, he had jumped 26 feet, eight and a quarter inches. A record that would stand for 25 years as he walked to the long jump pit. However, Owen saw a, two, a tall, blue-eyed, blonde German taking practice jumps in the 26-foot range. Owens felt nervous. He was acutely aware of the Nazis' desire to prove Aryan superiority, especially over blacks. At this point, the tall German introduced himself as Luz Long. You should be able to qualify with your eyes closed, he said to Owens, referring to his two jumps. For the next few moments, the black son of a sharecropper and the white model of Nazi manhood chatted. Then Long made a suggestion. Since the qualifying distance was only 23 feet, five and a half inches, he said this, why not make a mark several inches before the takeoff board and jump from there just to play it safe? Owens did and qualified easily. In the finals, Owen set an Olympic record and earned the second of four gold medals. The first person to congratulate him was Luz Long in full view of Adolf Hitler. Owens never again saw Long. He was killed in World War II. But he said this, you could melt down all the medals and cups I have and they wouldn't be a platting of the 24-carat friendship I felt for Luz Long. I'm talking about friendship, friendliness, friendliness. Someone said it like this, around the corner I have a friend in this great city that has no end. Yet days go by and weeks rush on, and before I know it, a year is gone. I never see my old friend's face, for life is a swift and terrible race. He knows I like him just as well as in the days when I rang his bell, and he rang mine. We were younger then, and now we're busy, tired men. Tired with playing a foolish game, tired with trying to make a name. Tomorrow, I say, I'll, I'll call on Jim uh, just to show that I'm thinking of him. But tomorrow comes and tomorrow goes, and the distance between us grows and grows. Around the corner, yet miles away, here's a telegram, sir. Jim died today, and that's what we get in deserving the end around the corner a vanished friend. You've heard me say this before, but you know what I want for Calvary Baptist Church? I want Calvary Baptist Church to be the friendliest church in North Carolina. And people can criticize us, and they may not like our doctrine, and they may not like our stand, and they may not like our style of preaching, but I want to tell you one thing. When folks come here, they ought to be able to say this. I'm telling you, I've never been to a friendlier congregation. I've never been to a friendlier church. When you go to Calvary, you can guarantee this. Those folks are going to be friendly. Amen. Serve through friendliness. How about this quickly? Number two, serve through forgiveness. Now, if you're in Mark chapter 10, I want you to turn over one page and look at Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11, and look at verse number 25. Mark 11, verse number 25. Listen, let me, just, let, let me just give you some good counsel tonight real quickly if I could. Mark 11, verse 25. The Bible says, and when you stand praying, forgive if you have aught against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. Luke 17, 3, 4, and 3 and 4 says it like this. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. 
And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day and seven times in a day turn again to say to thee, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. Listen, church, let me give you some great advice tonight. Don't hold on to the past. Let it go. Man, don't hold on to the past. Don't that, that, that thing that happened six months ago, that thing that happened six years ago, that thing that got in your call and, and, and messed you up, listen to me, let it go, man. Don't, 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 don't worry about the past. Don't hold on to the past. And by the way, I want to say this too. Quit bringing up the past. If somebody messed up, okay, they messed up. Forgive them. And quit bringing it up every other week. Man, it's no wonder people can't get along. It's no wonder folks are having so many troubles. It's no wonder homes are struggling. Hey, listen, forgive and forget and quit digging it up. Ultimate illustration. Turn over, if you will, to James chapter 20. James chapter number 20. How many remember the story? Peter has denied the Lord. He said, Lord, I'll never do that. I'll, I'll, I'll not only go to jail, prison, I'll die with you. And Jesus said, Peter, before the cock grows three times, you're going to deny me. You're going to deny that you know me. By the way, that happened. Peter denies the Lord. In fact, he even curses to try to convince those accusers that he doesn't know Christ. And not only Peter, but the other disciples. have. First, in fact, the Bible says they all forsook him. They all forsook him. And here in John chapter 20, the Lord Jesus sees his disciples for the first time following his resurrection. John chapter 20 and verse number 19. The Bible says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side, then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. My point is this. Jesus could have rebuked them. They forsook him. Peter denied him. The Lord Jesus, he wouldn't, of course, but the Lord Jesus, if he were like a lot of Christians, he could have held on to that. He could have dug it up, brought it up, threw it in their face and said, I thought you were never going to deny me. I thought you'd never forsake me. And yet every one of you for some reason, the Lord didn't do that. You know what? He sees his disciples and he says to them, peace be unto you as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. Listen, learn, just learn right now. Learn a great lesson. Learn to forgive. Just learn to forgive. Life's too short. Man, oh man, life's too short. You say, well, pastor, uh, you know, one of these days I'm going to get it right. You may not have one of these days to get it right. Tomorrow I'll be preaching a funeral for a young man that was 25 years old. You say, pastor, I got my whole life in front of me. You don't know that. And by the way, while I'm on that good and hot and heavy, let me talk to you teenagers. Let me talk to you teenagers that are going to a Rise Youth Conference tomorrow. If you've got all in your heart against another teenager, you ought to get on this altar tonight and you ought to get it right. You say, preacher, suck it to them. Suck it to mom and daddy. Suck it to them, preacher. Suck it to the, suck it, suck it to the adults. Hey, why don't we suck it to the teenagers a little bit tonight? Teenagers walking in here, walking up in here singing in the choir, acting like you're all holy, righteous. Then walk out of here and criticize another teenager. Come on now, I'm preaching good tonight. Walk out of here and criticize other teenagers and, and bad mouth and back talk and, and be a tailbearer and spread gossip and all this kind of stuff. Hey, you ought to get your heart right with God tonight. Amen. I'm talking about forgiveness. Someone said this. Someone said that basketball games are won according to the number of rebounds made. You know what a rebound is? 
A rebound means the shot was missed. Y'all with me? And so most basketball games are won according to those players that are able to rebound a ball. Truth of the matter is, Calvary, sometimes people miss the shot. You know who I minister to? I minister to folks who miss the shot. By the way, I hate to tell you all this, you're listening to a guy that's missed the shot on quite a few uh, opportunities. By the way, I don't know anybody that hasn't missed the shot. I don't know anybody that, that, that ever has lined up in life to, to try to hit the goal and, and they missed it or they, they messed up or they stumbled or they failed. And uh, my job is to encourage folks to rebound. Hey, rebound. You say, Pastor, I failed. Pastor, I, I stumbled. Pastor, I, I made a mistake. Okay, okay, but get up and rebound and go forward and don't stay down and get up and dust yourself off and God has something else for you to do. And by the way, hallelujah, I've got the best job in the world where I get to tell people, hey, you may have missed the shot, but get back up and go at it again. Keep on going and keep on going and keep on serving and keep on singing and keep on winning souls. Hey, that's what I'm talking about tonight. Our job is not to, our job is not to get all messed up because somebody missed the shot. And six months from now, we're still reminding them. Well, remember when you missed that shot? Remember when we were about to win the game and you missed? Remember when you fell? Remember when you got out of church? Remember when you messed, made a mess of your life? Oh, listen to me. Rather than do that, why don't we come along a side of people and say, hey, listen, we've all messed up, and, and, but I just want you to know I love you, and I, and I want to encourage you, and I want to help you, and I want to strengthen you, and I, I want to speak into your life. I'm talking about serving Serving through friendship, friendliness. Serving through forgiveness. How about this quick? I'll just hit this and go to the last point. Number three, serving through fellowship. Through fellowship. John chapter 21, you don't have to turn there. John chapter 21, remember the story? The disciples, I believe, they're discouraged. Christ has died. Peter said, I'm going fishing. The other disciples said, we're going with you. They go out, the Bible says in John 21, they, they fish all night, don't catch anything. And the next day, there's this gentleman on the shore. And he says, he hollers out and he says, hey, have you caught anything? <laughs> we fished all night and hadn't caught anything. He says, cast the net on the other side of the ship. Well, John knew. And John said, it's the Lord. It's the Lord. The Bible says it, that Peter jumps in the water and he didn't wait for the boat to come. He just jumps in the water and starts swimming to the shore. And the Bible says the other disciples come to the shore. And Jesus doesn't rebuke them. Jesus doesn't take them apart. In fact, the Bible says when they come to the shore, there's a fire and coals of fire and there's fish on the fire. And Jesus says to his disciples, Come and die. Man, I'm telling you. Is that the greatest example? Boy, if we, if we would live like that, we'd have so much less trouble in our life. Jesus didn't harbor resentment and bitterness and unforgiveness, although his disciples had missed the shot. He said, hey, fellas, I got a meal prepared. Come on, let's eat. Let's see. Come and die. Let's see. Hey, we serve through friendliness, we serve through forgiveness, we serve through fellowship, and we're done tonight. How about this? Number four, we serve through filling a need. Filling a need. Proverbs 3, verse number 27 says it like this, withhold not good from them to whom it is due when it is in the power of thine hand to do it. Say not unto thy neighbor, go and come again, and tomorrow I will give when thou hast it by thee. James 2 verse 14 says it like this. What doth it profit, my brethren? Though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? 
If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto him, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Listen, serve through filling a need. And how about this? Not only filling a need, but serve through filling a want. Listen, listen to what the Lord said in Matthew 5, 41. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile... Go with him, twain. Go with him too. Hey, if you know somebody in our church that has a need, quit waiting on somebody to fill your need. And before they fill your need, you fill theirs. And here's the thing I want you to understand. When you and I do something just to be a blessing, look out. Because you can guarantee something, it's coming back. When you just do something not to be seen, not so your name will be put in the bulletin, but you just, you know what, you were just watching and you saw someone in our church that has a need and you thought, I'm getting ready to be a need filler. And you didn't tell a soul about it, but you just went. You know what they, they needed and you went and you got it and you, uh, you left it for them or you gave it to them and you just did it to be a blessing. Understand, my dear friend, look out. It's coming back. Ecclesiastes 11 one says, Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Now we're going to bring this thing to a close, but I want you to tell you one last place. 2 Corinthians chapter number 9, and we're done. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and look at verse number 6. And I've got other scriptures, and I won't give you all these scriptures tonight, but I want to at least show you 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and look at verse number 6 tonight. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 6. The Holy Spirit says, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly or of necessity. Don't do it because you have to. For God loveth a cheerful giver. In verse 8, look at verse 8. And the Bible says, and God is able to make all grace abound. I love that verse, that word. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. In other words, you know what God is saying? If you'll give, not to be seen, but you just give as a cheerful giver, God said, look out. Because the windows of heaven are about to be open for you. Now I'm talking about serving. Someone said appliances don't serve themselves. Toasters don't eat their own toast. Refrigerators don't cool the food that they're going to eat. Stoves don't eat the food that they cook. A microwave, a microwave doesn't digest the food that it radiates. Can openers don't eat what is in the can they open. Appliances are there to serve somebody else. And we can benefit from that calling. God has assigned you and I a divine purpose and your fulfillment of that purpose should result in a benefit to others. So Calvary, I want to ask you something. Are you a servant leader? Are you a servant leader? By the way, according to the Word of God, I don't think those two terms can be separated. Are you a servant leader? One is not true without the other. Did you know you can't truly be a servant without eventually morphing into a leader? And you can't truly be a leader apart from serving other people. Someone said it like this, Lord... Help me live from day to day in such a self-forgetful way that even when I kneel to pray, my prayers shall be for others. Help me in all the work I do to ever be sincere and true and know that all I do for you must needs be done for others. Let self be crucified and slain and buried deep and all in vain. May efforts be to rise again unless to live for others. And when my work on earth is done, 
and my new work in heaven's begun. May I forget the crown I've won while still thinking of others. Others, Lord, yes, others. Let this my motto be. Help me to live for others that I may live like thee. Well, I'm so glad that our Savior was the greatest example of what I'm preaching tonight. He was a servant, but he was a leader. In fact, he was the greatest leader that's ever lived, ever walked upon the earth. Jesus was the greatest leader. And yet the Bible says he made himself as the form of a servant. If we're going to lead, we're going to have to serve one another. Simple fault tonight, but I hope, it, I hope it helps somebody. Would you bow your heads with us tonight? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Hey, I, can I ask you this? Are you right with others? Are you serving others? One of the best things that you'll ever do is just set, decide you're going to be a servant. I don't have to be the head honcho. I don't have to be the head hog at the trough. I'm just going to serve. I'm just going to try to be a blessing to the other members of the youth group. Oh, I don't agree with all of them. They do some things I don't do, and I do some things they don't do, and but that's all right. I'm just going to love them. And this week at a Rise Youth Conference, I'm going to be a servant. Man, we might have revival. If some teenagers went to a Rise Youth Conference this week and said, Brother Brandon, what do you need? What do you need me to do? Miss Mandy, what can I help with? What do you need done? I'm here to do it. I just want to serve. I don't have to be the leader. I just want to serve. Hey, how are you serving today? Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. Real quickly, I want to ask a couple questions. How many are here tonight? You'd say, Pastor, if I died tonight, I know for sure I'd go to heaven. I've been saved, and I know I'm going to heaven when I die. If that's you tonight, you can honestly say that between you and Christ. Would you just slip your hand up tonight and say, Pastor, I know I'm saved. I know that I'm saved. Praise the Lord. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Thank you. You may lower your hands. Can I ask this question, though? How many are here tonight? Come on now. I want you to really think with me tonight. How many are here tonight? And you'd say, Preacher, if a heart attack hit right now, I'm not 100% sure that I would go to heaven. And I care enough to slip up my hand and let you pray for me. Right now, you just raise your hand all over the building tonight. Anybody like that tonight? You slip your hand up right now. Pastor, if I died, I'm not sure about heaven. Would you pray for me? Is there one? Can I pray with you? Can I pray for you? How about this? Are you a servant? You have a servant's heart. When's the last time that you went out of your way? I mean, you went out of your way to try to be a blessing to somebody in your path. And here's the thing, maybe they didn't deserve it. But you said, I'm gonna be a blessing. I'm going to serve. Hey, listen. If God spoke to your heart tonight, I'm going to invite you to come. If you're here tonight and there is aught in your heart, unforgiveness in your heart, I'm going to tell you lovingly, I'm going to tell you what you ought to do. You ought to run down to this altar. And you ought to get it right with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, you ought to get it right tonight. And you ought to walk out that door back there tonight with a heart that's right with God. 
I want us to stand. Yes, I want us to stand. Father, this is the kind of stuff that revivals are made of. When we just make a decision that we're going to be right with God and we're going to be right with others. Father, I pray that you'll help us to serve through friendliness. Help us to go out of our way to be a friend. So many new families coming through the doors. Oh God, I pray that you'll help us to go to these folks and love on them. God, help us to serve through forgiveness. Tonight, God, I pray we're making it right. Lord, have your way. God, lay it upon the heart of someone tonight who would say, I don't know about leadership. I don't know what God's got for me, but I know one thing. Until God shows me what he's got, I'm going to serve. I'm going to be a servant. I'm going to have a servant's heart. I'm going to look for needs that I can feel. I'm going to look for those that are hurting and maybe I can help them. I'm going to be looking for those that are hungry. Maybe I can feed them. I'm going to be looking for those that are discouraged. Maybe I can encourage them. God, tonight, I pray that you'd have your way in this invitation. Lord, speak to hearts, I pray. And we thank you in Jesus' name. I'm going to ask our personal workers if they would make their way to the front tonight. And if you're here this evening, and God's speaking to your heart, I'm going to ask you to come. And, and quite a few have. But I'm going to ask you to come tonight and do business with the Lord. Church, I'm going to tell you something. The greatest life you'll ever live is a life of forgiveness. And just deciding, I am not harboring resentment, hard feelings. I am not. Life's way too short for that. Let's pray tonight, church. Let's pray while folks are doing business with the Lord tonight. If you need to come, the altars are open. You know what? Maybe tonight somebody needs to pray a prayer like this. Lord, show me how to serve. Show me what you'd have me to do. Lord, would you help my path to cross the path of that person who's in need? Now be careful how you pray that because I'll tell you what what will happen. He'll answer that prayer. It's happened this week. I like what's going on tonight. Father, I pray tonight that you're working hearts. Father, I'm thankful to see the altar used. Lord, help us to understand that the devil is so subtle. He's a trickster. He's a deceiver. And God, as we said this morning, if we're not careful, he'll help us to get our eyes on other things other than Christ. God, tonight, help us to seek to serve. Lord, help us to be a minister. Help us to be a servant leader. Lord, help our Help our path to intersect with someone who's standing in need, that person that needs encouragement. I pray that you'll help us to find those folks this week, somebody that needs Christ, somebody that needs prayer. Help us to intersect with them, Lord, please. I guess some folks have called us out on that. But this is a happy place. And for, for a lot of folk, this is their haven. And if 
you're looking for sadness, I'm going to tell you, you don't have to go very far down the road. You'll find sadness. And so that's why we want this place to be such an uplift when you come to Calvary. But you won't have to go far to find somebody who needs some help. Brother, Brother Mike and Miss Gay, their son John's in the hospital. And this week I went by and had a good visit with John. And we prayed together. And I walked, when I walked out of his room and I closed the door, somebody said, Preacher? And I looked around and there's a room across the hallway. A gentleman who used to attend this church, by the way, having a tough time, really tough time. I went over into his room and I began to talk to him and I said, man, what in the world? What are you, what are you doing here? And he began to tell me his story. And I said, can I do this? Can I pray with you? And he said, oh man, I wish you would. And I said, I'm going to pray with you. And I said, I want you to be sure you let me know. I said, keep me updated about what's going on. And if you need me, and I gave him, I gave him one of our tracks. And I said, listen, our number's on there. And if you need me, I said, you call me. You call me. That happens all the time. I left the hospital. I went over to, to the hospice house. Brother Randy's daddy was just at the point of death. And I went and went there in the room for a little while and visited with Brother Randy and Miss Lisa. And I left there and I began to walk out, out of the hospice house. And all of a sudden my eyes met another gentleman. And we looked at each other and was like, hey. I said, brother, what in the world are you doing here? And he said, my mom is in here. The boy just heard his family was weeping. I mean, they were just weeping. And God opened up another opportunity just to try to minister to somebody else. Hey, folks, I'm telling you something. That don't just happen to preachers. That happens to God's people. And if you'll pray, Lord, help my path to intersect with somebody who needs ministry uh, look out it's going to happen and when it does be a servant be a servant hey let's sing this great great chorus tonight aren't you glad for the day that he touched you amen altars are open if you need to come let's sing it ready here we go here we go he touched me oh he touched me somebody like that and brother Randy was struggling and he said preacher I'm having a hard time and he was and we prayed together and asked God to give grace and I told Randy I said you know Randy I said you know what's probably going to happen God's going to help your path probably to intersect with somebody else and they're going to be going through something really similar and you're going to be able to be able to say let me tell you how God brought me through it. It always happens, church. Man, I, I don't think I've done a good job preaching, but man, what a truth. Let's go out here tonight with this attitude. I'm going to serve. I'm going to be a servant. I'm going to be a servant. All hearts free tonight? Amen. We'll find the Hobsons tonight. and Be sure you welcome them to Calvary Baptist Church. And we'll be talking to Brother Hobson about coming back. And then be sure you find the Brown family tonight.
and welcome them tonight. And then all of our visitors tonight, if you're visiting, we're so glad to have you in the Lord's house. We're going to have a prayer of dismissal. We're not going to have any meetings tonight. And so, listen, be careful going home. And we look forward to seeing you this coming Wednesday night. Be sure you pray for the uh, crowd that's going to arise. We've got a big crowd going to Arise Youth Conference. And so pray for the crowd that will be traveling tomorrow. Pray that God will give them traveling mercies. And, uh, and so, anyway, God bless you all. I appreciate it. Brother Tim, I'm going to let you dismiss this in prayer. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be in your house. Lord, we love you. It's been a wonderful day of ministry. God, thank you for pouring into our lives. And so, God, as we leave, I pray that that will be our prayer. May we cross paths with someone that we can pour your spirit, your power, your grace back into them. Lord, take us, Lord, as lights into a dark world. I pray that, Lord, you'll fill us with your spirit while we depart. May we minister to those around us, love our families, and bring glory and honor to you. Thank you for this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. We consider it an honor to serve you. And our prayer is that the service was a blessing and an encouragement to your life. If you were impacted today by the preaching of God's Word, we encourage you to respond. If we can pray with you, or if you would like to make a decision today for Christ, please call us here at 704-327-5662. We have people waiting right now on the lines prepared to help you. Again, Thank you for joining us today, and we hope to welcome you again soon. Have a wonderful week.